trigger warning. This podcast contains discussions about abuse, domestic violence, and intimate partner violence. Listener discretion is advised. What you are about to hear is a true story. My story. This podcast is about me, my abusive marriage, my fight for my life, an eventual daring escape from my ex-husband and his enabling family. My name is Bibi, and I am the Authenticity Warrior. My discernment about what I am facing has made me a target, but I must nonetheless speak up. Hello, guys. Hello, everyone. Yeah, we're back, and we had to take a break. The last episode we were discussing, it was dense it was draining it was physically I wasn't expecting to be as wiped out as I was and there was actually a lot more material I guess than we had expected to be able to cover in in one episode because it really was just a lot yeah because I think when I just put them out in bullet points I thought okay we could get we could talk about everything in one episode but you know fleshing each incident out we've 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 had to split it up so this is the second part of that just like continuation to kind of wrap up everything that i'll be discussing under the banner of like the physical abuse that i endured in the hands of this man and tora i have to say i'm still like this is still just one heading though (laughs) exactly (laughs) like we're still trying to work through some of the other things that i had mentioned in my email which I'm sure by now you must have heard already. And if you haven't, we will list it out again. To my ex, today, I choose to dismantle a shame that is not and was never mine to carry by shattering my silence on the dynamic of our relationship. I have been severely mishandled, mistreated, devalued, and taken for granted over the entire course of our relationship and marriage. For almost 10 years, you have been a toxic and abusive partner in many horrifying ways. 1. Physical assault 2. Sexual harassment, coercion, and continuous threats to pursue other sexual partners and including your continued weaponization of infidelity. Three, extended violent outbursts of extreme and scary rage and anger. Four, relentless emotional manipulation and verbal abuse. Five, bullying and intimidation as tactics of control. Six, Reckless and dangerous behavior as a means of punishment. For example, dangerous driving with the children and myself while in a rage. 7. Financial neglect. On several occasions, not even the presence of the children nor any of my visible pregnancies could deter your blind rage and there was no effort on your part to model appropriate behavior, thereby terrifying and distressing the boys. At your hands, the boys and I have been in distinct life-threatening incidents, and your continued unchecked behavior has worn me out. In tolerating and accommodating all this, I became a person I no longer recognized. I will no longer allow myself and my children to be subject to a toxic and unhealthy environment and exposed to barbarous behavior. I am separating myself from you and this marriage. There is absolutely no room for reconciliation on this. I am done. We've heard the email. We're just going to pick it up and continue. Okay, so one of the things that you had listed explicitly on your email that actually gave me real cause for concern was when you had said that Paulinos had engaged in reckless and dangerous behavior as a means of punishment, which is engaging with just 
driving crazy or behaving crazy while behind while behind the wheel Mm -hmm. with you and the children in the car Mm -hmm. so was this just like a one-time thing was it something you came to expect as okay if he's in a mood then we can expect that if we're driving he might act crazy or like that's just really alarming to think that he would do things that would endanger his family and himself as such yeah i i i it got to a point where I just finally started to understand that this guy has serious anger issues and almost to the point of being like suicidal hmm. because it felt like once this guy is angry, there is nothing he wouldn't do to show his anger, even to on to the point of death. That is what I started to understand because I couldn't ex- explain the bizarre dangerous behavior like this guy something could have upset him an hour before maybe we head out or whatever and then we get in the car and he's still fuming he would have raged and raged and raged trying to calm him down because i'm just like okay like it's enough kind of thing but he won't be he he he, he could never be pacified until he got his anger out and it didn't matter sometimes would would maybe we're heading out somewhere and you know would have to get into a vehicle and he's the way he's driving again in on these lagos roads like mm-hmm. very dangerously and Sometimes I could tell that he was doing it on purpose because he's trying to elicit a fearful reaction from me that I could tell because some the movements would be so sharp, the speeding, especially on that third Milan bridge. Like some of you that live in Lagos, you know, that bridge is, is wild. Like it's not the kind of place to be pushing 120, like going that high. Right. You know? Like, yeah, exactly. It, like <laughs> so going that reasons. fast, like, what right. is it? And because that bridge also has potholes, like going that fast and you 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 enter into a pothole, you're going to fly, and uh, weaving and bobbing and um, bobbing between cars and just and I will look at him and I'm just like, please, can we slow down? And I, he's still angry, he's still fuming. So it's so the whole time he's doing this, he's also yelling and just creating okay, so, chaos inside the car. Okay, so it, it happens both ways, right? This kind of this this um, reckless reckless behavior that I had described in my email, where if I'm the one that is driving, for example, this guy will literally turn his body if he's in he's in the front seat and face me, and be screaming at the top of his lungs, like screaming, shouting, "You're so stupid! That's why you're like this!" Blah blah blah, going on and on, and if there's this is a massive distraction to someone that is operating of course. a vehicle. Mm-hmm. And I would be dead silent because I'm just focusing on this road that I'm driving. Are you screaming at the top of your lungs like this? Being such a massive distraction because like what reaction are you trying to elicit from me right now? So I would be, I would try and me, I have nerves of still. I'll be very calm and I would just face the road that I'm driving on and be very careful because I'm just like, this guy is not going to get whatever reaction he's trying to get out of me. He's not going to get it. And he'll be going on and on, arms flying everywhere, just behaving like a massive. Working himself up. Like, yeah. Working himself up, like going off. And don't forget, Toro, that I'm often not the only one in the car. Oftentimes, if I'm driving and he's in the car, then the children are there. The nanny is there. And this mm-hmm. guy will not care that he's displaying like this in front of our children. Sometimes the night we won't start to beg him. Oh, guys, okay. Oh, God, please calm Goodness. down. And I will be so, like, forget about being embarrassed. Like, the, how many times would I be embarrassed in front of my nanny? At some point, it's like, it's just part of a course. Right. She will be the one begging him. And I will just be facing the road. So that's one angle. The on- other angle is if he's the one that is driving and he's pressing that accelerate so like a mad person and i'm just like i'm like please can you calm down or please can you slow down the boys are in the car i'll be trying to talk in very because it's one thing for me to be driving and for him to turn into an ogre the last thing i want for someone that is already driving dangerously and recklessly is for him to now start raging as he's driving Mm -hmm. so in the most in the calmest most gentlest of voices I'll, i'll be trying to Hey, please, can you slow down? You're moving a little fast. 
and he would ignore me. Like, he wouldn't say a word. He would just, one arm on the steering wheel, like like this bad guy or whatever, just, sometimes he would even be wearing his shades. Mm. And this guy is ignoring me. I'll be so, and the nanny is there, the children are there. I'm not trying to alarm, you know, I'm not trying to cause a scene here. But this guy will ignore me. Occasionally, even the nanny will be like, ah, Oga, I beg, maybe, maybe slow down mm. kind of thing. That's ah. And my second son, he often even used to get car sick. Wow. So it's not be trying to use that one as an excuse to get him to slow down. And this guy would just ignore me. He, he wouldn't care. So, of course, when someone ignores you like that, my own thing is like, is it that he's trying to get me to act outside of my character by maybe shouting or saying something? So for me, when I feel like someone is trying to manipulate my behavior, I often shut down. I shut down and I don't give them the reaction that they want. So I'll just be quiet. Sometimes I'll just hold on to my armrest and, you know, you know, the door armrest. I'll just hold on very tight and I'll just be like muttering under my breath, trying to pray, just trying to like pray in the spirit and just like God, just like, because I'm just like, if it's like this man wants to kill us here, so me, I'll just start praying to God that God should just keep us safe. God should just help us. Let's just get to where, where it is that we're going. But I just would be so disgusted by the behavior. I think it's an intimidation tactic. Um, and it's a well-documented like strategy of, of abusers to choose when they're in the car, a situation that requires like control, concentration, to then just drop all that just to be emotional, to be able to vent, to be able mm-hmm. to lash out at you, to be able to use you at a punching bag, like to scare you, to all sorts of things, to manipulate you, to be like, okay, if you don't, I'm going to drive this thing off the off this cliff now if you don't, like, mm-hmm. you know, do things like, like women have, lots of women have come out and, and spoken about that. So like, it's just crazy how like these patterns of behaviors from these abusive partners, abusive men, it's almost like, like it's running a script. Like it's just yeah. so crazy like that. It's instances like this that just kind of cemented for me very early on in my marriage that I I, I am not dealing with someone that is actually normal Mm. but you know when number one you love someone because people wonder "Ah, if if he was so bad why didn't you leave or things like that and when you're dealing with individuals like this there's a lot of up and down there's a lot of confusion here so I've seen this person be good I've seen this person Mm. act right I've seen this person seemingly have consideration and love and care for other people so when they're now doing crazy, diabolical, diabolical, evil things like this, like for someone that loves them, you're very confused. You're like, what is causing all this? Sometimes as a victim, you, inter- you internalize it. You think it's your fault. You think, oh, maybe if I hadn't, okay, maybe if I didn't say, get him upset. But again, like I always say, I honestly cannot tell you head or tail anything that I've done to this man in this relationship to cause any of this. Oh, of course. They just get triggered unnecessarily by very random, silly issues that really shouldn't trigger anybody. Fine. It can be an annoyance. Okay. It can be irritating. Okay. It can, you know, it can be whatever, but for you to go into a blind screaming rage, you want to kill somebody on the issue. Haba, what is it? Because it's often not, it's often not the issue. Like whatever leverage it was that they used to say that, oh, it was because of this that I did this, that I did this is it's not. It's often like much deeper underlying things that really have nothing to do with you that they're often dealing with that they simply just externalize. It's so funny because there was a time our our sister, Lulu, our younger sister was actually in the car. One of these days she had come to visit. She stayed over. She was in the car and he, she, she did not know that. He behaves this way. Yeah. She did not even know that something had happened that morning because we were on our way to oh. church. So she did not know that he was upset with me over something. Even myself right now, I can't tell you what he was upset about, but he was upset with me and he was holding a grudge. And then we get into the car and then we're headed to church. Our church is on the island. We lived well into the mainland. 
And my sister, Lulu, was just, after we got to where we were going, she was just like, ah. in fact, in the car, she would be like, ah, please, <laughs> this is a little, mm-hmm. this is a little fast for me kind of thing. And so I'd even try to also say, but he just kind of brushed it. I think he laughed, he brushed it off, but he didn't reduce his speed. Mm. So, but I didn't say anything. But then when Lulu was trying to talk to me about it, that, ah, <laughs> yeah, that was... like, what was, what was that about? I, it was later on that she learned that oh, he was upset with me and he, he, were put, he used that as a tactic. But because there was someone like my sister in the car, he didn't, he was trying to hide it under his just, he's, he's, he's joking, he's, 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 he's just having fun or he acted like, oh, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, you know right. how he didn't act like it was because he was upset that he was doing yeah, it. Yeah, he was trying to act like he, it's not that he was upset that, oh, maybe I'm just a fast driver or whatever, which mm-hmm. he actually isn't on a normal day. He's actually very slow. He, he's, he's not very sharp on the road, actually. Mm-hmm. But when he's angry and upset, he turns into some sort of fast and furious uh, type, uh, <laughs> type driver. So, so he just tried to act like, oh, maybe this is how I normally drive or whatever. But it was now later on that I had shared with her that I knew he was actually upset with me. And he was trying to get a reaction does. out of me with that kind of driving that he was doing there. So it, 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 it's, it's, it's very disheartening that, you know, someone in anger would put not just his own life, but every other person that he supposedly cares about. Okay, fine. Even if you don't give the flying fuck about me, your children are in the car. Right. And like, you know, external people as well, like your sister, your family, like... People who are not, <laughs> yeah, this, uh, yeah, I and, don't even want to try and understand or rationalize it because let me know there's nothing to, to be me. understood there. Let me it's all to you too. And I'm not trying to be petty for you guys that are listening here. The cars that we even had, if we're not even the kind of cars to be even using to be doing this kind, <laughs> this kind of rough play. Defense Those control. cars that were literally like hanging on <laughs> for <laughs> their life. Like on a wing of the prayer, those cars were not the cars. On Lagos roads again. Right. Oh, no, that's crazy. So these these rageful incidents don't sound like they were few and far between. They sound like they were often and common and just a regular backdrop to your time being married to this guy and the the backdrop, the background of the environment and the toxicity. Mm -hmm. So like, what was the cycle? Like, was there ever really like a proper resolution, a proper like coming back down to baseline before another flare up again? Like, what was all that like? So like, it's funny you mentioned the rage being the backdrop of our relationship because it was. So when you say baseline, the baseline is just walking on eggshells waiting for the next rage fest so there was never really any time of just i'm relaxed i could never settle because i don't know what is gonna set this guy off don't get me wrong we had good times we had laughs i mean i have three children clearly there must have been some good times in this relationship but the good times happened with extreme caution and care from my end and if I ever just relaxed a little bit or felt oh wow I mm. I guess we're good oh wow I guess I love this person I guess one thing one thing this guy will remind me with precision mm. that I am never to be relaxed in this relationship because you're laughing you're joking you are you do one thing one thing and something will happen and it's it's like he there's a switch you don't mm. know. So how did how do we ever, I guess, recover from the rages? The entire burden was on me. I have to be the one to say, yes, you acted like a bloody fool, but I can't hold a grudge. Because if I hold a grudge, it is just going to keep that, that pressure cooker environment in the house so i'm the one that just has to keep forgiving and forgiving and forgiving and saying sorry whether i did something wrong or whether i did not do anything wrong or i just have to be saying sorry to this man Ekbele, sorry you Ekbele. even got to a point where i remember early on in our in our relation early on in our marriage this guy had said to me i know i can get upset i know i can get angry but there's one thing you can do for me 
that will help me know that, oh, you really have my back in this thing. That will help me know that, oh, you really care. And, you know, immediately I see you do this thing. I promise you. It doesn't matter how angry I am. It doesn't matter how loud my voice is. I will immediately pipe down. I will immediately calm down. Eh? Just, just trust me. So he was like, this is what I want you to do. Once you just see me angry like this, I want you to just kneel down and just start apologizing and just start rubbing my leg or, you know, rubbing my head, you know, maybe if it's in a seated position, just, just start rubbing me, just start rubbing me. Eh? I just, you know, if, you are, if I want to see you on your knees like that, doing that, you should help me calm down. I will no longer be in a rage again. Ah, so. I, I must admit to you, Toro, all of this was very bizarre to me because I'd never seen anything like that. Even amongst, you know, even my own parents, like their generation or whatever. But it didn't seem like such a foreign concept because I guess I've heard situations like that where there are some women that, you know, they kneel down for their husband, you know, especially the Yoruba culture. Where right, I was going to say, like, kneeling is like integral to our culture. But like, I feel like the circumstances are different <laughs> yeah, 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 but, but I guess it could also but be, it didn't seem as foreign it felt weird and bizarre because I mean we were in our tw- early 20s like what's all this kneeling down about right it's usually um, another thing he used to say was oh I'm, I'm a traditional guy I'm a traditional guy so that's what he used a lot of as a banner to kind of hide or cover a lot of his abusive behavior is oh he's just traditional he's just a traditional guy but in actual fact he's just a flaming misogynist that hates women Simple mm. and short. But this whole idea of kneeling down didn't seem... It was weird. It was bizarre. I never saw it in my own house. I don't know anybody personally that was doing it. But I had... It wasn't so foreign that... Because I, it is cultural. I mean, even at the traditional wedding, exactly, they will make you do that. Exactly. It was which, cultural. I mean, uh, in the 2020s, I'm just like, mm-hmm. I think that needs to be... <laughs> But but yeah. understand exactly. I, this is someone that I knelt down for during my traditional wedding too. I guess in my head I was like, oh, okay. I mean, he's he seems to be giving me the and, off button exactly the kryptonite <laughs> <laughs> because at this point I'm starting to understand that okay, this guy has rage issues, and I guess he's giving me the solution, right? Because who who wants to be getting raged out like that too? I remember there was one time he was raging at me. His eyes were red. Toro, I. Like, it felt like this, this is not, the, I don't know this person. His eyes were red. His eyes were vacant. There was no human being there. There was no person there. And I got so scared. I just, I didn't even know when I, I dropped to my knees and I just started saying, sorry. I just started apologizing. I, I, I was even afraid to touch him because, you know, of how he was moving. But I just said, let me try. So I, I started gently just like rubbing. His leg just saying, sorry, I'm sorry. Just please forgive me. I was doing all that. And I'll never forget the guy. He, he looked at me with those rageful eyes. He looked at me as I was on the floor because he was even standing. He looked at me and he was breathing heavily like. <sighs> like. And then he brought out his hand. As if to like lift me up. Mm. so like he brought out his hand and I, I guess I put my hand in his in his in his palm and he lifted me up from the floor and I think he, he said thank you thank you for doing this now I know that now I know you really care or something oh silly like that and as much as he was there thanking me as much as the rage stopped as much as I felt oh I guess this off button he gave me actually works I could not shake off how I felt as a person. Of course. I, yes. I, I, I felt demeaned. Like I felt, I didn't feel good at all. It's a stripping of dignity for someone to only feel whole or big when someone else is on their knees. It's because it is undignifying. I, and I'm just... Like it didn't give what it was supposed mm-hmm. to. Like if this is supposed to be some sort of bonding draws closer together moment or now I know you really have my back I felt I didn't feel good at all like you said I felt it felt like such an it felt I felt less and it's not because I can it's not about the kneeling down but it felt like so 
I felt, I felt, I felt used. Like, mm-hmm. and it, more so because this wasn't even like a genuine, it, it's not something that I would naturally do, but it felt like he made me do it. I felt manipulated into that. Mm. And so I did it that one time and the rage stopped. He was very happy. He seemed to be, like, his like peace just entered the home. He calmed down from that moment. In fact, he now became all lovey-dovey. This was like in the first year of our marriage. He came very lovey-dovey. He was just so appreciative that I did that. He was like, thank you. He, he kissed me. You know, he held me close. All, all of that, all of that. And me, my love language is touch, but everything he was doing there just was not landing. He didn't land because bottom line is you're trying to pile on all this sweetness on top of shit. Yeah. You just you did something terror. to me that was humiliating to me. And now you're trying to massage it all out with the love and the kisses and the all of that. And it didn't feel good. I did this thing. It happened one other time again when he was in a rage and all of that. And I deployed it. I deployed the off button again. And he piped down again. Peace came back. But I said, no, I'm not doing this again. This isn't authentic. More so, again, the first time he had covered the action with all the love and kisses in the world. This time I could, I could, I was starting to feel a serious sense of entitlement mm. to it. That's it was, always what happens, yeah. This, he did not cover it with as, as much sweetness this time around. So I'm just like, mm. and should you have continued, it would just have become something that he just became entitled to. Yeah. Or would even weaponize as a punishment. Mm-hmm. The avenue of abuse just even widened even more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, like, so I said to myself, I'm like, no, this isn't me. I can. Ap- I, and that's one thing about me. I know how to apologize when I'm wrong. I would take full responsibility. I'm like, I don't need to show so this is. I don't need to do this before someone can know that I'm sorry or I apologize for whatever it is I may have done wrong. This is this 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 doesn't really feel like it's about an apology. This feels like it's about control. Mm. And so from that day, I never knelt down again for this man. I never did. And who knows, maybe his rage fest, of course they were going to continue regardless of my behavior, but Maybe a part of him was always seeking that power of how loud or how long or how crazy can I act before this woman will actually drop down to her knees again the way I made her do the, those early times. And that's, and that's the key there. And that's how you know that it's a tactic of manipulation because like when you do it, like you said, it's not authentic to you. It's not something that you do. It's something that you do out of survival because this person is subjecting you to so much violent energy and harsh energy coming at you. You're literally doing it to make it stop, Mm -hmm. to get some reprieve for yourself. So Mm -hmm. to even be doing it out of survival in the first place is Mm -hmm. is wild. And in true abuser fashion, I'm not surprised that he would he would try to push buttons and and escalate to see if he wouldn't get it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and then to answer your question again, because you had said, like, how do things actually resolve? To be honest, a lot was often swept under the carpet. It's, it, I, I had to be the one suppressing the things I had problems with, the things I had issues with. I, I never felt safe to bring anything up with this man. If I did, I would be, shout, I would be shut down. I would be shouted at. I would be, what's the, rather than t- take accountability, you pull out some left thing that oh, I had done in some time. That's hey, me too, I did it. Like, so I, I just started to understand that, okay, this guy cannot, nec- this one cannot really be worked with this is not like a collaborative space where we're both coming together to make our family run better this this feels like some sort of one-up manship kind of thing with this guy yeah and for me like me i grew up as a middle child like i i'm an athlete me i they compete but i'm just like not with this kind of individual so i would just shut down i wouldn't i would i would have to bring things up if i did if he accepted it good if he didn't accept it no problem I, I just kept on adjusting 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 and bending another thing that this guy too would do is he would rage he would act like a mad person craze out all of that and then i want to it felt like i could it felt like we could never resolve things on my own pace mm. or at my own time if i came i'm like hey let's try and get through 
he would either not want to hear it or just rebuff me. Sometimes he would tell me to get out. He's not ready to talk, all that kind of stuff. I would go. It will only be on his own terms. That's okay. We are trying to resolve things. He would have kept all the malice he wants to keep. He would have kept all the beef he wants to keep. Then when he's now good and ready, he will now come. And there's, I don't know what it is about the middle of the night. Somebody's really sleeping. That's when he'll come and be waking somebody up. Just tap me. Pass, bah, bah. Oh yeah, let's talk. Oh, mm. like somebody, me, I don't joke with my, I've never mm. joked with my sleep since I was a child. So he's now in the middle of someone's REM sleep that you want to come and be having a conversation. If I don't cooperate, it will seem as if, eh, like maybe I'm, I'm reveling in the, in the fact that tension, I, yeah. yeah, I'm reveling in the tension too. You know, I will often be forced to okay start having some sort of a heart to heart conversation in the middle of the night. And again, the person that I'm talking to, I can tell it's not really about us coming to a resolution. He just wants to win mm. because in the first couple of years, I was I'll, I'll, I'll be trying to explain. I'll be explaining. No, that's not how I meant it. No, that's not how it happened. No, that's not. I will explain over explain over explain. He will. So I will. I will explain. He will pick on one word that I said like this. Turn it. Change it. And I just started to see that. It's like this guy actually doesn't ever want to understand me, understand my intentions. He just wants to be right. He wants the narrative of whatever it is that happened to be his own narrative. He's not interested in the truth. He's just interested in, in number one, winning and showing me why I need to listen to him or showing me why or I had... saving face. Exactly. And I soon just started to give up. You know, it's like, okay, have it your way then. Mm. But can you see how even doing things like that is manipulative? Because when somebody is sleeping, you know, like I, I wouldn't, my, my heart breaks for, you know, certain people that their sleep is, is finicky like that, where maybe they don't sleep well. Like that or, couldn't be me. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah <laughs> it's difficult for them to go back to sleep. Me, I can't, me, that sleep when I can't sleep, I can go back to like that. My sleep would never be disruptive, disrupted in any sense. Once we're done talking, I can go back and sleep like a baby. But my heart breaks for people like that. Their sleep is, ah, some people are struggling to find sleep and then just imagine someone coming to wake them up, get out uh, thrashing things out in the middle of the night. The, the person um, is, is uncooperative, like, ah, gosh. It, honestly, it, it really, 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 really sucks being with an abusive partner. Mm. It really does. Sucks. Okay. okay. So, I mean, out of everyone, I'm the one who has essentially been here or been with you from the beginning, at least from the point of your escape. And so I've been privy to a lot of this information from before. I'm not hearing a lot of these things for the first time, but let's talk about a specific situation now. And I mean, the marijuana incident. Mm. This was one particular thing that you mentioned to me that really just left me feeling very uncomfortable very shook and just extremely thankful and grateful that it didn't go more left than it did mm -hmm. or end up end up just really tragically because it really well could have. Mm -hmm. So just tell me about or talk about that incident and from the beginning and stuff and how it all went down. Yeah. Sometimes when I'm even recounting these stories, I I know as I shouldn't beat myself up. I know that I did the best that I could with the information that I had. But stories, when I have to, you know, say a story like this, I, I sometimes I, I have to stop myself from crumbling just under just the sheer weight of, oh my goodness, I, I, I really, I really choked. <laughs> I really choked. So I, I, I speak about how when we got married, that's when a lot of things were just coming out about this guy. Things that weren't necessarily apparent there before, like the heavy drinking, the just the craziness. I wouldn't say that we're not apparent. I'd say that he had manipulatively taken action or manipulatively, like intentionally tried to hide from you or keep from you or prevent you from knowing about. OK, you know what? Let me even rephrase because a lot of the time, eh? He, he didn't actually, what he tried to do is he tried to get ahead of the story. He jumped ahead and he 
he kind of told me some of these things, full disclo- full disclosure, as if I'm just trying to be honest. But he had framed it as if this is who I used to. I am no longer like this. So with the heavy drinking, he told me about his crazy partying, drinking, smoking weed, doing drugs, all of that, even selling drugs, even dealing with prostitutes and this and that. And But he had the way they will now come to you and telling you this in a very humble, sometimes almost even on the brink of tears. Oh. Like, this is who I used to Reformed be. Reformed and rehabilitated. Exactly. But, you know, I'm no longer like this. And, you know, when he when because I, I think I didn't ask like when around when, you know, it, it felt like it had been some years. Mm hmm. Right. Prior to him meeting me, not as if oh, it just happened last year and then he met me. No, he felt like, oh, this was in the distant past. But he's just he's just bringing into my table, just letting me know, just full disclosure. That's how he brought up a lot of these things. He's, he's heavy porn watching. He had brought that. In fact, he had even given me the code how if you, you can you can kind of put a lock on your browser mm-hmm. to block out like porn and all that, all of that. So he had even giving me the password he said here i want you to hold on to this so that i can never access this again that you know he's really worked hard to kick his porn habits he doesn't watch porn anymore and that he wants like here like it was like a gesture like this is the password i want you to hold on to it kind of thing so he had done all of that as if that life is no longer my own i'm on the straight and narrow he wasn't drinking the two of us were drinking tea all the time so he had done all of this. So by the time we got into our marriage and he started to really just unmask, it was shocking to me. Um, mm. But I do have to say something about the marijuana thing. So I remember prior to us getting married, he had just jokingly said, oh, I, 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 I wonder what you'll be like, hi, kind of thing. Like, I wonder mm-hmm. what it would be like, you know, to hang out with you, hi. Because one of his the things he should say to me was like, oh, I'm very... I seem very repressed or kind of like He's trying to loosen you up. Yeah. That uh, he thinks I'll be a really fun person if I'm high. And me, I just get rebuffed it. I beg go, please. Go. <laughs> me, I don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> it was just my own response. Just kind of rebuffed. I ah, know I'm, I'm sure you'll be fun. Using style to try and see if I would take the bait. But, you know, in that time, me, I didn't even think he was baiting me. I just felt like, ah, don't worry. You don't worry. Like... <laughs> It's not likely I wouldn't get high kind of thing and whatever. And we'll let it go. So, of course, we got married. And then sometimes in good times, he'll be like, again, ah, we're having so much fun. Uh, it would be good maybe if we just like if we could get high together and just and just see how it goes. Mm-hmm. Just almost trying to paint it as if, oh, getting high is such a fun time. It's so great. I'm, I'm sure you would love it. Like he's like he was he was he was trying to. He's evangelized now, Abi. <laughs> he was just trying to shut us. He was hyping getting high. And he was really trying to sell it to me that, oh, I'm sure you would really like it and all of that. But, you know, with these people, they change up tactics. So maybe you saw that the sweet mouth he was using <laughs> did not work. Before I knew it, he was like, oh, gosh, you're so boring. Mm. All that kind of stuff. Like, you know, he will now flip it. That was then getting high now. What's the big deal? Right. Kind of thing. Again, for me, I, I I don't really know too much about drugs, but I was shout out of the understanding that okay, weed is not is not that conky drug. It's not like ah cocaine or anything like that. So I wouldn't really push back. I didn't really care either way. But I just felt like for me personally, I just didn't have an interest in it, and I didn't see why he kept on pressuring me to do it. So there was a point I was trying to make. So yeah, so I, I think behind all of this in the backdrop, because we got married 2016, weed became legal in Canada 2018. Right, yeah. And then in fact, like people, you know, yeah, it became legal in Canada 2018. So all of that is happening. His random requests to get high together. Or well, let's just do it now, just once now, all that kind of stuff. Up until now, I'd, have, I'd actually never seen him smoke weed myself. Mm. So I just assumed he was just trying to resurrect something from his past life. And he, I guess he had so much fun getting high. He wanted to share the experience with me because you have all these crazy stories. Oh, his friends and how they would do and blah, blah, blah. And all of that, you know, sometimes you won't pass a comment that he he can't trust anybody that he cannot get high with. Mm. Almost trying to make me feel as if ah, maybe there really is something wrong with me. Bottom line, Sha, weed becomes legal in Canada. I start to feel like, ah, well, I'm Canadian. If Canada is saying, if Canada is making weed legal ah, and it seems to really matter to this man for me to get high with him, ah, maybe I should try. But I 
do have to admit that my actually getting high with him, it wasn't even about him. It was actually about you guys, Toro. <laughs> I think I had had a conversation with you guys and I found out that I, I have three sisters. For those who don't know, I have three sisters. And I found out that I, you guys used to... <laughs> cannabis gang. <laughs> exactly, cannabis gang. Like you guys used to get high together. And I'm just like, ah, so isn't it only me that'll be left out here? You know, <laughs> you guys be getting high together. I'm just like, no, you guys should not activate my middle child syndrome, please. Me too. I want, I want to be part of that gang. <laughs> so... I had just shared with him that, well, that my sisters always, is like they get high together and they just, it's a bonding time for them or whatever. I guess, let me know what it will feel like. More so Lulu, my younger sister had also shared that the first time she got high, it felt like she was flying. To me, I'm just like, me too, now I want to fly too. Let's see, let's see what it's all about. So I mentioned it to him. He seems very happy that, oh yes, finally I'm going to do it. So I'm like, okay, when now? Let's plan. He was like, oh, no, no, no. He's not going to tell me that when that as it's happening, he will let me know that he did it. Like, he, like, but he'll make sure it's a weekend, all of that, all of that. So I was like, okay, sure. No problem. We'll leave all of that alone. So fast forward to sometime in 2020, Sha. I know that we were already on lockdown. I was working remotely and I believe it was also a weekend. And it was a Sunday because we, we, we always eat fried rice on Sunday. So I know it was a Sunday. Fried rice had been prepared. And then my nanny, she had set the table, all of that. All I just knew is she, she had passed the comment that, ah, madam, no eat that fried rice. So something, something. That Oga put something inside the fried rice. So but, you guys were going to consume it like edibly, like you were going to eat it. Uh, yes. No, but you know, me, I didn't know. Mm. This was... Fried rice was prepared. My nanny is telling me not to eat the fried rice. And I'm like, why? <laughs> why shouldn't I eat the fried rice? She said, ah, Madame Oga put something inside. No, no, wait till he puts, but he put something inside this uh, fried rice. So, of course, I still didn't know. Because again, the last time we had spoken about it was sometime in 2018. We, we hadn't, oh, wow, that you know, away. this is 2020 mm-hmm. now. It didn't even occur to me that something, it was weed or anything like that. But me, I just rebuffed them. Just like, first of all, the Oga that doesn't ever really enter the kitchen, what's he... I just felt like, oh, maybe I didn't understand what she was trying to say. I was just like, hey, okay, no problem. I, I hear, I don't hear you. But I think I just gathered, we gathered ourselves at the table and we're just like, okay, we're going to eat this rice or whatever. So, of course, I'm eating the rice. I can't taste anything different in the fried rice. And then he's like, ah, no, eat more. Eat more of the fried rice and everything. I'm just like, ah, why? Like, what's the big deal? So it's now as I'm eating that, he now tells me that, ah, I put... I put the thing inside. I'm like, you put what he said. He has put the weed inside that today's day we're going to get high together. Mm. So I was eating the fried rice. He had a bit. He had more than a bit, but he had put a huge portion on my plate. He had made me finish eating the fried rice. He even added more. And I was like, you know what? I'm actually stuffed. Like I could Mm. not eat anymore. I was like, look, I'm done. Funny enough, that particular day, that's when we had our family Zoom call. (laughs) Right. <laughs> you know, lockdown had happened. Families were were touching base via Zoom. So my my own family Zoom call was happening literally in like 30 minutes. This was in the evening. It was around seven or something. So it's around six or six thirty that I had eaten this fried rice. So I even just told him that, ah, okay now, no problem that. Hope I'll not go and be acting mad on the family Zoom call. It was like, ah no, don't worry, don't worry. That's when you eat it, it takes a while for the thing to really mm. hits but when it hits it hits really hard so i said okay no problem and everything we get to the zoom call <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> guys we get to the zoom call and everything is going normal in fact i'm even i'm scribbling as we're all just talking just in all of a sudden i'm just it's like i'm feeling hot <laughs> <laughs> everything i was like I, what i was scribbling it felt like my eyes were darting back and forth, back and forth. Like I could not focus. Mm. I couldn't see. Like everything was blurry. I was hearing you guys, the, the ch- talking that was going on on the Zoom call. I would hear something I would want to contribute or participate, but I felt like I was shouting. Like mm. I felt like I was acting up. <laughs> so in fact, I, I just remember, I remember mommy's voice and I was just like, you know what? Let's let's let me not display for these people here. So I think I found a way to just round up. The, ah, guys, sorry, I have to go, kind of thing. So I just kind of rounded off, and I was just like, bye. I didn't even wait for you guys to say bye. I just like mm-hmm. closed my laptop and just like, eh, 
what is going on here? What is this uh, feeling or sensation? Like, what in the world is going on? I, I just know I wasn't myself. I attempted to stand up and it felt like I was walking a tightrope. I, I, in fact, I decided to use my hands to try and navigate because he was not even with me. He had excused me because of the family meeting. Mm. So I kind of navigated my way to our bedroom door. I had found a way to open the door, come out. I find him in the living room there and I'm like, oh God, what the hell is going on here? I couldn't stop laughing. Mm. I was trying to talk and communicate, but it was just laughter that was coming out. And he found it funny. He just started laughing. This guy had assured me that this thing was not going to hit. Because as I was eating that fried rice, I'm like, look, it's still too early. Let the, let the boys go to bed first. Like, I don't want mm-hmm. to be high in, in front of the children or anything like that. He was like, nah, don't worry. It'll take a while. Blah, 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 blah. So this is still like, what? 7.30 max. The mm-hmm. boys usually go to bed at 8.30. So I was ready. So that's what I was trying to communicate to him that like, yeah. <laughs> Down. Me, I am high. Like these boys, because I, I was dizzy, but I was still seeing like two little human beings. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm like, send these boys to the nanny. Like they can't see me like this. So that's what I was trying to communicate. But it was just laughter that was coming out of my mouth. And I was laughing and I was laughing. I was trying to stop. I couldn't talk. I, just, not, I mean, you were laughing, but you were not finding any of this funny. It was not all. funny to me at all because I was just trying to like get these boys away from me. They mm-hmm. must not see me like this. I even became embarrassed because I thought that by the time the thing hits, I would have said my last words to the nanny for that day. Like it would just be you mm-hmm. and I doing this thing. But now I felt so exposed. I felt so irresponsible. I now remember that the nanny was saying that our oh, girl put something inside mm. this man. So like I was just, I just became so paranoid that, oh my God, my children, oh my God, the nanny. Like I, I felt so exposed. So that's what I was trying to communicate to this man. But it was just laughter that was coming out. Mm. And he too was laughing. So I was trying to say, stop, stop, like stop laughing. Your, your laughing isn't, is making me laugh. Mm-hmm. Hear what I'm trying to say. So I will gather the strength. I will feel like I've said something, but he will just laugh again. Then I'll start laughing. Mm. I, I'll now be like, stop, stop, stop. I will now say again that the nanny, children, like I will communicate. Then, But he will ignore me and just be laughing. I felt so, I felt so defeated in that moment because I'm just like, he started to feel like this guy is egging me. He's egging this laughter on. Mm-hmm. It's not that he too, he's high. It's that he's, he's egging on my own high. That's mm-hmm. what I felt. Creating the feedback loop. On yeah, he, exa- that, that thing that you're saying, feedback loop. I felt like I couldn't jump out of the loop. We, 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 I felt like we repeated the same scenario 10, 15 times. I was, it felt like he was on a loop and I'm trying to get this thing to stop and it wouldn't stop. So just imagine like the, in, just the beginning of this high just being so chaotic as it was. I'm mm-hmm. like, this is goddamn not flying. This doesn't feel like flying at all. Anyway, I think finally the message is passed. All I just know is the, the, the children are ushered away. The nanny, I think they go off to do whatever and I guess they eventually gets into bed or whatever but bottom line i'm with the guy we are he's laughing he's laughing he's laughing i'm laughing but i'm terrified like everything that i'm feeling it feels like all my worst fears have jumped out and they're like i feel like i'm in a very dark place at some point eh, i actually held him by the by the pants I held him by the shokoto i said you cannot leave me like this i was like okay i've i've felt what it's like to be high oh yeah Make it stop. So this doesn't feel nice at all because it sounds to me like you, it's panic and yeah. paranoia and just sheer like, yeah, yeah. And I want unhinged him, like that's that's what mm. it felt like. And I and I, I want the experience to stop. I've it's done. I've had enough. And I just felt so terrified, feeling like there's no. I have to write it out. That's yeah. what it felt like. Like there's no stopping this. And that is exactly what it is like when you consume cannabis orally. 
like that. They're one to ten and ten. It's in exactly. So I held him. I don't know for how long that I did. When he'd be telling this story to people, he would say, "Ah, that like she she held me with my pants and she did not let me go." We sat. We, I had to sit down with her for you know maybe you say for thirty minutes or whatever, whatever. I should know that I held him. At some point, I just managed to crawl from where I was. I literally crawled from the living room like I was feeling my way because I couldn't see. My eyes were darting back and forth. I couldn't see. Mm. It, it was more painful to actually have my eyes open. So I actually closed my eyes and I was navigating my way. I navigated my way to our bed and then I just, I laid down there and Toro, I was tormented all night, all night. I didn't sleep. Everything about my life, all the fear, everything that I, all night I was tormented. But you know what? There was something that in retrospect, I'm like, my goodness, my subconscious is a badass. In that moment, I said, I felt unsafe with this man. Mm. I, I was like, this guy is trying to do something to me. This guy means, doesn't mean me well. Mm. It's not safe. Yeah. And I remember even saying to him, you did this to me. Mm. I said, I, I remember I was like, you did this to me. You knew this was what would happen and you did it. And I remember him just laughing, like just cackling. But this time, and at this time, we haven't, you haven't said how much he put in that fried rice. At this time, you didn't know. I, I didn't know. I, mm. You know me, I didn't know. So bottom line, guys, I stayed in that fetal position all night. The whole day, I don't even know, like... I, I think the it was next a, day, you mean the next day, mm. it was like a public holiday or something. So thank God for that. Tuesday, I think I had to even just like call in sick and be like, guys, I can't mm. one thing, one thing. But I was high for three, three whole days. I couldn't function. Goodness. I could barely eat. I did not leave that bed except to maybe use the washroom or something. I did not leave that bed. By the time I finally came down from this high, it's like the high sparked malaria in my body. Mm-hmm. That's when, and me, I don't even fall sick easily. But immediately I finally just felt like, okay, I'm now myself again. I now had malaria for like the next three days. So that entire week was just like, I just, I just told him, I said, come, 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 come. This weed thing, don't ever... I am never doing this thing again with you, eh? Never. So that's just how that one ended. I'm just like, I don't care who wants to, who thinks I'm for no, who thinks I'm not for no. I just, I, I want no parts of this thing. So he still did not tell me anything about what he puts inside, did not put inside. All I just knew is there was weed in my food. I got high. It was a bad experience and that was the end of it. But this guy always used to do a thing where People would come visit or whatever. And I got used to being the butt of this guy's jokes. Mm. He would always crack jokes. Ah, this is my wife say if she does like this, she does like that. Everybody will laugh, 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 laugh at me. It's it's unfortunate. But I do say that that is also a running theme in my life where a lot of people feel the need to like ridicule me or laugh. And so I grew up just getting used to that. And being able to just cope with it. I wouldn't get upset. Occasionally, I would even laugh too. Even, especially if it's embarrassing, I would just laugh and do as if it didn't really bother me. So I've, I've grown up just being the butt of people's jokes occasionally. Not occasionally, a lot of the time. Um, but it's disheartening for me to say that, like, I, that became a standard pattern in my relationship with this man. He would often make fun of me when he's telling his stories, he's holding court with his people, with his friends or whatever. He's talking about me and he's using me to jest. Everybody's having a good time, but I am the butt of the joke. So this marijuana story now became one of his shticks. Like, how do you, how do you say that word? Shticks. Shticks. Yeah. One of his shticks that he would whip out to be telling people that, ah, this is my wife said. If party you, favorites. Exactly. If you see the way she, she displayed when she took weed for the first time, she, you know, you know, she's a, she's a, maybe she's SU, you know, you know, she, she never take weed Light before weight. this one. Uh-huh. But ah, if you see as I give her weed like this, if you see the way she act like this man, he shall use, 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 
People will laugh, 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 laugh. He will whip it out, whip it out, whip it out. Anyway, so I guess one of these his days when he was saying the story, someone had someone had said, but why you can't do like that now? Like how much weed did you even put inside him? And I say, ah, I have not three I put inside. He put three blunts. And I think the person was like, eh? Three. The person For a first timer, that's that's beyond wild yeah. and reckless and dangerous. If and you remember when he was even telling you, because mm-hmm. you had called shortly after when I told you that, ah, this is what happened to me. Mm-hmm. I go high you and I, I don't ever want to do that again. I think you had also asked him and you, you said how much did you put inside? I think you said three and I think you were just like, ah, that's a lot more than that. If, especially if you're ingesting, it's just supposed mm-hmm. to be a little bit or whatever, whatever. Yeah. But like, yeah, but it wasn't until at this time, maybe we were hosting people, the person had pushed back. Some I don't even know who the person was again. I don't even remember. But the person was just like, ah, but why you put three inside that? Three is a lot now for someone who has never mm-hmm. came in before. So I think that sobered everybody up in the room. I think the laughter kind of stopped abruptly and then people were like, oh, that's actually true. Like... Mm-hmm. Three and I think the person had just kind of cautioned that ah I think I think you overdid it kind of thing. Bottom line is, later when I heard him telling that story to another set of people, I noticed he had changed his story. That oh, I now only one I put to, mm. and so for me, it registered. I think that's when I said to myself, this guy did this shit on purpose, because. You, you, because that means you knew it was wrong then. For you to now all of a sudden now change your story from three to one, that means there was sh- there's shame involved. You did this shit on purpose. And let's not forget, this guy is a seasoned weed connoisseur, if you will. <laughs> there's no way he didn't know. There's no way you, you there's no way you wouldn't know that as a first timer, even if even, just a first timer. Period. It could go any way. You always want to, like, with any kind of substance, mm-hmm. a little bit at a time. See how it goes. See how it whatever's. Like, even with edibles, even if you even if you take a conservative dose and you don't feel anything, the advice is to still let that let that work through before you're saying, like, oh, I don't feel, I don't feel, let me top up. Like, mm-hmm. it's just it's yeah. wildly irresponsible and it could have gone, gone any way. And so... I'm glad you bring up this marijuana incident because for me, I look at it as this man poisoned me. Because what I now know about like overdoses or just people having bad reactions, like I have never used any kind of drug before. And you think it's okay to take three whole blunts. And this is in Nigeria we're talking about who even knows the dosage that people are working Mm. with. Three whole blunts. And you put it inside my food and you tell me to eat it. And the way he heaped that fried rice on my plate and the way I ate it too. My goodness, this guy was trying to harm me. What if I'd ended up in some, like, some sort of state? This is Nigeria, a hospital. Like, before they even start to even investigate what it is that is the problem. Like, it's crazy to me. It's crazy. And so for me, that again is just a manifestation of this guy's reckless behavior and just... I, I I mean, I can't tell. I can't tell. It's despicable. Now, wow. All of this just makes me remember again that like, because I I do have to admit, let me not lie, that in the course of our marriage, this guy would just be bringing out stories from left field ooh, in the, about the, his past life. And I guess at first for, for a church girl like I was, I was pretty, I never did streets before. Some of these stories. Sheltered, were, yeah. Were exactly. They were exciting it seemed like, wow, this is, it's like this guy has lived multiple lives. Thank God is now on the straight and narrow. But it's, he seems to have really good stories. He seems to have bizarre stories. But for the most part, they, they felt entertaining. But I would, over the course of our relationship, our marriage, I would hear them over and over and over again. And I guess as I started to grow or as I just became more mature, these stories didn't seem as fantastical anymore. They, they seemed kind of diabolical. I'm like, ah. so of course I remember a couple of occasions when this guy had said how sometimes when, when he's giving credit that ah, 
the way his life is now that is God that must have really saved him or that he himself that he's the one that is responsible for a lot of for some of his boys that their lives have kind of been fucked up in a way by drugs and like mm. alcohol that ah he remembers that he's the one that introduced some boys to some really bad things that he really destroyed some of these people that they've never gotten their act together ever again he mentioned mm. how one friend was actually confined to like a psychiatric ward there's mm. one that almost committed suicide there's another one, another one that is like just such a just such a fuck up like he can't get his life together he's like just constantly in and out of rehab his fa- their families are really suffering Mm. So he would almost say these stories as if a oh, testimony that ah that God saved him kind of thing that some of this is other people that they were doing this this shit together they've still not been able to get their act together but in my is is now that I'm just thinking about it that like so you introduced is is like was that his plan also with me was he trying to mm. jack me up in a sense is that why he gave me such a high dose. Maybe he was trying to shock my system into craving or getting addicted to the substance. Like, I don't understand. Or just did it for the sheer, what's it, entertainment value for him. Mm. And either way, there's just, there's absolutely no justification for it. Or just, yeah, you've objectified someone, abused someone and objectified someone so much that. Yeah, it's like a court jester for you. Like mm-hmm. So like you said, it definitely shows a pattern of behavior. I'm, I'm clearly not his first victim in terms of giving, missing someone to drugs or to alcohol or... I don't even want to know how those guys were introduced. Like, was he also such like a, a harsh introduction to these things? Again, I'm not one that has such a conservative view on weed and drinking and all of that. Each malam to his... Uh, what's that term again? <laughs> it's my lab to his ghetto or whatever. But I do feel that, my goodness, there needs to be, this guy should have handled things with a lot more care and a lot more just consideration, especially knowing he knows a lot about these properties. This is somebody that was a heavy drinker and weed smoker According to him, in his descriptions of his past life to me, and I'm inclined to believe that even now, because a lot of this shit came out in our marriage, he he knew better, but he purposely put me in that kind of position. And I'm just so glad that my subconscious, even in that state, called it. And I was just like, this guy did this thing to me and he did it on purpose. And this guy is not safe. And he was trying to harm me. Mm. I think continually about our children who this guy will always, his alcohol, when he's drinking, you you try and get them to take sips, you try and get them to sm- to sniff it, to smell it. And since they were babies and I'll be complaining and he will just always make it seem as if, well, I'm just making a mountain out of a molehill. It's not a big deal. Eh? They don't even like it. Eh? They're not even, they don't even like the smell. So why am I making such a big deal? And I'll be like, yes, but you keep introducing them to it. At, at a point, they will no longer be recoiling and running away. But you just kind of brush me off. And I think that honestly is what I've really hated most about this guy is I will, against my better judgment, this guy will continually make me feel as if I am making a big deal out of nothing. He will continually make it seem as if I am just so wound up that I should relax. I should relax. I should relax. But this is just what I mean. Even to our children, it's like there was nothing sacred here. There was nothing safe here. These are children. They were, they were young, like aged one, two, three. Like, what is it? So to imagine again that this is just part of the priming, part of the grooming to a point where they too now can become hooked onto something because maybe he feels alone in his addiction or in his mess. And it's like he doesn't even care who else he tries to recruit to join him there whether it's his wife, whether it's his children, whether it's his friends, whether it's whoever. So all of that is just so upsetting. Seems to me like he's been dishonest, like right from jump, even about just your compatibility to begin with, Mm -hmm. like to the point where it now seems like he has to wear you down and grind you down and whatever to even get you to participate in some of his own extracurriculars. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you've you've heard it over the course of the last two episodes and even in the next two, you get to hear like, you know, especially when I'm speaking about the sexual abuse, like, my God, 
what this guy extracted out of me violently, I might add, is just, it, it, it really is just heartbreaking. It really is just heartbreaking. Okay, so the last thing, the last specific incident that you wanted to speak about under this um, banner of physical, verbal, emotional, psychological abuse is the February 2020 incident, as we are now referring Mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. Um, And this was one situation that was so extreme that it pierced your disillusionment about the condition, environment, situation, danger, really that you were in Hmm. so can you can you talk about it describe it describe what led up to it how the actual incident was and how essentially that kind of became the beginning of the end for you in terms of this relationship yeah when I think about that day I cannot even put into words I can I wish I could bottle the emotion of that day and just like show it to people and be like, see, this is what it is. But that day, like you mentioned, rightly so, marked the beginning of the end for me. It was the first time where I actually wrote shit down. Like I wrote it down. Everything that was said to me that night, everything that was done to me that night the emotions of how I felt, I wrote it down immediately, piping hot. As it happened, I wrote it down. Why? Because I realized that over the course of our marriage, over the course of our relationship, this guy would do this fucked up things to me. But because maybe the mind of an abused person, you love this person, you want to forgive, you want to move on. You just want to just let things go. You don't want to have things hanging over your relationship. You don't want to be resentful. I will forget. I, and I'm someone that has such a good memory. Well, that's a thing. Trauma also rewires your brain and has an effect on your memory. You don't remember. You see? These are things that I'm just finding out now. But when I was in the village, I'll be like, I know because sometimes when we're fighting, he'll say, I've never done that to you. And I'll be like, no, but you have. Then he'll challenge me and be like, when? And my mind will just go blank. I can't remember. Mm. I've never said that to you. I'll be like, no, but you have. When? My mind will go blank. I can't remember. Mm. But I'm just like, no, but this isn't true. You have done these things to me. You have said these things to me, but I will never be able to remember and you know and spew it back to him and be like yes you did this thing on so 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 date and blah 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 blah. so I know I have all this pain in my body I remember my like my you know when I say my body remembers but it's like my brain would just be failing me I will not be able to pull out the incident and say this is when you did this this is when you did that that's also the result of which is of, of something that is always a huge part of abuse, which is gaslighting as well. Yeah. Where you come to distrust your own mind, your own memories. Yeah. Not knowing what happened, forgetting things, having blanks. Because I, know, and periods of be like, blanks. I, but you, you that you did, are you trying to tell me you actually don't remember? Like when this guy choked mm-hmm. me, because some way you you'd be like, eh, I've never, I've never laid a finger on you. And I, in my head, I was just like, ah, mm-hmm. are you actually forgetting that you are the one that literally was Squeezed strangling me mm-hmm. to the point where I thought, am I literally about to die? Stats have also shown, stats have also shown that in, like in relationships where there's strangulation, in those relationships, like it's, the like homicide of the of the woman uh, interpartner I mean, interpersonal what's it called intimate intimate partner violence wow so strangulation is death. a huge indicator for homicide wow and in case we're speaking too much English murder yeah <laughs> like my god so when this incident happened eh I said the way I said eh I must never the way I will not forgive my soul if I forget this thing. So as it mm. happened, piping hot like this, I started to write it out word for word. I, I, the, my, my, my computer memory as it is, I started from the beginning to end. I was writing it. The words he said, the things he did, I wrote it out. Then I saved it on my phone as a note and I, and I locked it. 
So mm. nobody can access it. If you click on that note, it's blank. Nobody can see it unless I open up the note. Mm. Because I said, I will not forget this night. Because again, what in the world actually happened? What is the big deal? Kilo Shele. Some random silly hairline issue. I can't even tell you that I know what it is. Mm. The only reason why I'm even able to kind of piece things together a little bit is because I remember the position that I was in. I know I was in our bedroom. My iPad was on my side. My phone was on my side and I had my laptop open and I was working. The fact that I had my laptop, that means I was working because if I'm just watching something, my laptop wouldn't be there. I'll just use my iPad. So I was working that evening, that night. It was nighttime. It was night. It was night. So I was working. This is late into the night. I was working February 2020. There was a lot of craziness at my work because there was all this pitter patter about lockdown. The right. nature of the company that I was working in, we were, st- we were a tech startup. Like lockdown would have impacted us if we, di- if, we did not, if we did not adjust, if we did not figure our shit out. So there was a lot of craziness at work in that period. So I was working. All I just knew is this guy walks into the room, probably says something to me. Maybe I respond. Maybe, maybe I'm not really f- focused on listening to what he's saying or whatever. I'm just like typing away. I'm doing my work or whatever. All I just know is he, is he goes away for some time. Then he comes back. I see he's holding a glass. He had, he, and when I say for some time, at least maybe an hour or two, mm-hmm. he comes back. I'm still working. He's holding his, uh, I see he's holding his, 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 his glass with, I, I don't know, that drink, that brown drink. Is it um, scotch or I don't know which one mm-hmm. is brown. Well, anyway, he's shy, he's shy holding his drink. Then he says something to me or whatever. Maybe I respond in a manner that wasn't, maybe I'm just. You like, were working, so you weren't as engaged yeah, with him. Yeah, I wasn't mm-hmm. as like focused on what he's saying or whatever. I'm just like, I'm just trying to do my work or whatever. It's late into the night, for God's sake. All I just know is he, that sets him off. He's angry, screaming demeaning me maybe saying hey what, what kind of job is it that you're doing self how much are they even paying you you know he, it wasn't uncommon for him to demean me or demean my work like that how much are they even paying myself what kind of rubbish work am i doing blah blah blah, blah. i can't even answer a simple question he went on went on went on went on went on and in my head i'm just like for good maybe he said there he asked me a question and i didn't answer i'm just like if you ask me a question and i didn't answer did you bother to ask again maybe i didn't mm-hmm. hear you kind of thing Kisha just didn't want to hear anything from me. He went on and on and on. I can tell that like by this point, I had even sat up from from where I was. I was now, I was no longer in the position that I was in. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at him because he was going on and on and on and on and on. So I was waiting for him to, so that I could then respond and say, Mm -hmm. "Ah, I think you're making, you're blowing this thing out of proportion. Maybe, oh, I probably, I I don't think I heard you when you said blah, 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 like, don't be upset Mm -hmm. or whatever. But he was just going on. Then he started to go on tangents. That's Mm. how you always do this. That's how you get, he was going on, 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 on. His voice was raising. He was screaming. This is in the middle of the night again. And in my chest, I was just getting so embarrassed. I'm just like, my goodness, the neighbors downstairs, the neighbors to our left, the neighbors to our right, everybody can hear this guy. But he just seemed like, that's when I now really fully noticed that, okay, it's like this guy is drunk, actually. Mm. He's not that, he's like, he's drunk. So that's why I can't even get a word in. I can't even, I can't even get a sorry in. Mm. It's like, he doesn't even want to be pacified. It's like, he is using this as an opportunity to lash out. To vent, yeah. To vent. Maybe whatever it is that has been doing him, whether about me, whether about his job, but he has found me as the scapegoat he wants the to outlet, use tonight. Yeah. So that's when I knew that, okay, this guy is looking for somebody. He has, I've entered it today. So he's going on and on. Then he starts to call me all sorts of names. That's the one that I just, you know. So I said all of this to say, guys, I, I, I took some notes. And I'm just going to read it out like the way, the way in which I wrote it is how I'm going to read it. And then we will now 
circle back to the event of that night. So I wrote 2nd of February, 2020, 3rd of February, 2020. So that was, it was into the night. It was overnight that all of this happened. Mm. So this happened for a couple of hours. Mm. By the time the whole thing ended, it was already well past midnight. So that's why I put those two dates there. And so I wrote, the worst I have ever seen or been through in my life. The vitriol, the hate must not be forgotten because it can and will never change. Your head was pushed and your nose was smushed four or five times. He assaulted you with a towel four times. Who knows what will happen next? You were called a bitch and bastard countless times for hours on end. You were cursed at countless times, called a motherfucker, called a fucker. Absolutely nothing was left unsaid. He even included Yoruba curses. He ridiculed me beyond measure. He called me a monkey. He referred to me as unworthy and less than. I received the full brunt of poisonous words, disgust and anger and threats. He threats of physical violence. He he threatened me countless times and indeed felt unsafe. Anything could have happened to you. You endured this for hours on end, at least three hours. Baby, it is very clear that you are truly on your own, yourself and your children. I, baby, can never trust this again. This is clearly over. Love does not live here. I have been living under an illusion and now I can see clearly. I wrote this in capital letters. Then I wrote this again in capital letters. You are being abused. So don't ever let yourself forget the humiliation, pain, poison and demonic words said to you tonight to break you. But let me assure you, baby, you are amazing, wonderful, beautiful, lovely and loved by many. You can never be broken. The very best is yet to come. God, your family, and your friends have got your back to the fullest. I love you and the boys very, very deeply. God bless you always. That's what I wrote to myself. How does it feel to read that again now? I'm so proud of myself. Hmm. I'm so proud of myself. I'm so proud of myself. I love that I spoke life into myself. And I, I remembered who I am. And I said to myself, like, and I love that. I, I said, God, your family and your friends. I knew I had people. Hmm. There's no reason for me to be here. So that's what I wrote to myself. So now let me try and explain to you how things were happening in that moment. So as he was saying these ugly and unprintable words to me, calling me a bastard, calling me a bitch, just a motherfucker, called me a monkey. Mm -hmm. At some point, he started to lay his hands on me. He mm. push my head. You're just a motherfucker. You know, you know how, you know how when some parents... That meme with From Power. Oh, yeah. Where that guy, he smushes. He smush, smushes yeah. his head. Yeah, exactly. Where so, goes smushes his, his wife or ex-wife or whatever. Uh-huh. Her head, like, so disrespectful. Exactly. Like, so that's what he was now doing to me. He pushed my, like, he did that thing like four or five times. He was just a motherfucker. That's why you're so stupid. This one, he'll push my head. Then he will now tw- at some point. Then 
he will now leave me, he will now twist my nose. You know, he'll oh you know God. grab onto your nose and twist it. Mm-hmm. And I'll say, that's why you're like this. You now push my head. He did that one too, another uh, four or five times. Then at some point, he now grabbed his towel. He started to whip me with the towel. All of these things, he's doing it systematically as he's pushing my head, as he's twisting my nose, then he grabs the towel. He's still talking, he's still screaming, he's still shouting. That's why you're like this. You now hit me, push me, do all of that. Exhausted himself on all of that. I can't even hold myself anymore because at first I'm like, this guy is crazy, he's mad and he's trying to elicit a reaction from me and I'm not going to make a sound. So I sat and I was looking at him dead in the face as he was, as he was, as he was displaying. Then I decided to lay his hands on me. My, my, my compartment got mm-hmm. disrupted. You know, when someone pushes you, you, you mm-hmm. know, you move in that direction. So that, that frazzled me because I'm realizing to myself now that this guy is touching me now. Mm. It's one thing for someone to be behaving like a mad person in front of you. But in my head, I'm just like, now he's touching me. And he's, I can feel the, the I, I, you know, I feel the energy the, behind the, the yeah. energy, the, 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 his, I can feel, I can feel his touch on me. And it's a demonic touch. I did not even know when I just started to cry. I was just, I was crying. Tears were coming down from my eyes as, but I, I still did not make a sound. I was just crying and I was just looking at him. Then I looked at the, at the, at the, at the exit to our room I looked at that door and I was like I was calculating I'm like should I just run out of here to my children to, to, to my children's room like should I just bolt out can I just leave because again I can be very st- spiritual in the sense that this guy is saying all these things to me and I'm feeling mm-hmm. just the disgust the negative energy and I'm just like I need to get out of here but I was looking at that door I was looking at him I said don't even try it because I could feel that look if I even try and make any sudden movements up from this bed the way you know how you're about, you're about people say Timba DMU or Timba mm-hmm. like this like that was the energy that I felt so it's like this guy is actually waiting for me to try it, it yeah. Yeah. so that he can grab me and before I know it this guy is pummeling me to the ground so I sat still there I did not make any sudden movements Again, like I told you, I had my laptop, I had my iPad. Oftentimes when this guy is angry in a rage, he will threaten to break my laptop. He will threaten to break things he didn't buy for me. My laptop, mm. my iPad, my phone. He will threaten to, to, to break them. So mm. I said, no, 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 no. I'm not even going to give him because I had actually just bought the, 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 the laptop myself mm. in December. This is February. Two months old, mm-hmm. brand new. I said, no, I'm not going to give this guy because I'm sure it was paying him that I bought it myself. So I said, no, I'm not going to give him an excuse to now try and break my laptop and break anything of mine. So I, again, my sitting down there was strategic. I'm like, nope. Number one, I'm not going to give him the avenue to probably beat me up the way he, prob- he, he really wants to. But because my demeanor is so calm and I'm seated like this, he, he, he can't escalate this, this abuse in the manner in which he wants to. Then I said, two. These are my devices that I'm using. I'm not going to give him the opportunity to smash my laptop against the wall or my iPad or my this or my that. So I sat still. So he did. He exhausted himself. He did everything. Called me all the names. Ugly. This and that. That's why I'm stupid. He said it all. I, I, I mentioned the Yoruba curses. Olori Buruku. That's why it will not be well with you. Like saying all the in Yoruba, saying everything. Then... We, of course, he had now finally exhausted himself. Guys, if you remember when I told you that when he had locked me up when I was pregnant, how he himself, if he knew he had gone too far, so immediately he knelt down and started begging, started mm-hmm. apologizing. So I'm still, I'm sitting down, I'm weeping, I'm seeing him display. And in my head, I just, in a way I'm holding out. I'm like, there's no way this guy is going to finish because at some point, you have to shut up, Abby. Mm-hmm. In my head, I was expecting that, oh, the same thing will happen. He'll probably drop down to his knees and start apologizing. Not that I would have accepted the apology, but in my, in my head, I was still holding out for some sort of remorse because I just felt like yeah, there's no way. Yeah, anyone should even know that this has 
Mm-hmm. There's no way. So this guy, what did he do? He actually climbed onto the bed, laid down, and fell asleep. Like, he even started snoring deeply. A sweet sleep. Ah, he was on the back of that snore that I grabbed my phone and I started writing out all these notes. I said, what? Hmm. He did all this. Not an apology, nothing. In fact, he laid down, slept. Ah, no. That's when I knew. I was like, nope, I am dealing with something otherworldly. This does not make any sense. And the following day, he traveled. He went, he traveled for work. Mm. He woke up. I was still thinking that. I was still holding out that ah, this guy will wake up. He, maybe he would tap me and be like, ah, I'm sorry. That thing that I did to you, blah, blah, blah. Nope. He got up business as usual and carried his bag and left the house, went on his flight. And I did not see him for a whole week. He did not call me, did not message me. Hmm. Ah, that's when I knew. I said, no, I've really entered something. He was now on the back of all of this. That all this time when this guy had been abused, had been abusing me, had been abusive to me. I never told anybody. But this one was so bad. Like I called his sister. Mm. His sister, his older sister, they're only a year apart. I called her. On this podcast, her name is Pepe. I called her and I told her, even she too, she was shocked. She said, ah, no. She told me that, eh, that you're not safe. That you have to leave the house. That nobody should treat you like that. Blah, blah, blah. She said that mm. I, should, I, should, I should leave her brother. Pepe, she said that. I think I now, I, I spoke to his mother that day. I called her because she was not in the country. Mm. When I started to narrate, even she, she was like, eh, baby, ma so mo, ma so mo, ma so mo, mi fegbo, mi fegbo. That, ah, he laid it for you. That, ah, mi fegbo. When I was, because I, me, I, I was not trying to hold back. Oh. I was still there saying, my mother, fuck her and fuck her mm. to this woman. Because I'm like, this is what Isha called me. Oh, the translation of what you just said is, it's too much, it's too much, I don't want to hear. Don't oh, yeah. Yeah, stop speaking. Exactly. Yeah. His mom was like, ah, in, in Yoruba, what she was saying was, ah, I don't want to hear, this is too much. Eh? This one, that one, that's what I said to her. But what was disgusting about this whole thing was that, like, I, she, she hung up the phone. This is Polinus's mom. Polinus's sister had told me I should leave the house, I should go to my parents, this one, that one. But in my body, I just felt like, look, there's no way I'm going to go and tell my parents this one. And they will allow me, like, that's the end of the marriage. Now, what else is there to say? Mm-hmm. And as, 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 as much as I hate this for us, I hate this for us, for those of us who've been abused by these ogres, I hate this for us. We love these people. So even in, in these moments, we are still there protecting them. We are still there covering their shame. In my head, I'm like, the only reason why I did not go to my parents was I did not want to expose this guy out to the world. Mm. I did not want to expose this guy out to my parents. I still felt like, if I do this thing now, the fights that my parents are going to fight, that's the end of this marriage now. And if I now don't leave this man, that's almost the end of, like, I mean, mm. my parents will never abandon me, but that's, o- that's also kind of souring that relationship. Like, you mean you're going to stay with this man? And I hate this for myself and other, other people who've been abused by these people that we actually, the only sin we, like, what did we do? We just love. That's all we did. And that love that we have literally cages us. I still did not have the strength to say, I am leaving this marriage today. So mm-hmm. I do say it's the beginning of the end in that like from that day on, you can you can no longer remain unconscious to exactly. your abuse. That's what it is. The, it is from that incident that I, I started therapy. Mm-hmm. I got a therapist. So, you know, all these things just unravel by themselves. I can, I, I can admit that if I had just taken the decision of, oh, let's say, because I told you he traveled, if I had just left, and then by the time he came back from his trip, he saw that the house was cleaned out. I was not there. 
Mm. This guy would have been put in a mode of panic where he would have come to beg me. He would have come to, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, as a victim or, uh, you know, as someone who's been abused and you still love this person, there's no way that, that person will not wear you down. Mm -hmm. But because I was not empowered, but this path that I took now where I've been empowered, mm -hmm. there's nothing this man wants to say to me today. It can never happen. I can never, ever open up my heart, my life to that Paulinus again. He is cut off from my life forever. He mm -hmm. will never have access to me again, ever. But I have to admit that in that February 2020, when all of this happened, I wasn't as empowered. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine a revolving door of abuse. He would have come, mm -hmm. he would have begged me, cried on my head. Before you know it's now, I'm gathering myself and my children. We're going back there. Then I'll still go and chop another abuse again. Each time you do that revolving door thing. The bar becomes lower and lower. Exactly. The bar becomes lower and you become weaker. Yeah. It becomes a pattern of your relationship. You Because you dissipate energy. Every time you gather the strength to leave and you come back, you lose energy again. Mm. And that's how women get trapped. But as I've been able to live in this empowered way that I did, it can never happen again that I will ever be in a relationship with this man again. And so I never have to worry about that revolving door. I'm not dissipating energy because I left in an empowered fashion. I left in an empowered manner. And that's because I saw him clearly for what, for, for what he is. An abuser, simple and short, who never loved Mm -hmm. Forget about loving me. He doesn't know how to love. Not his children, not his family, not anybody. He doesn't even love himself. So I said all of that to say that like, yes, it, that was the beginning of the end. But I want to highlight again the behavior of his family. His sister had said that I should leave. His mother was like, oh, I don't want to hear it, blah, 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 blah. It wasn't up to an hour she called me back. The first thing she says to me is, look, you have to grow up. Oh. You have to grow up. Then she lays into me hmm. that eh, your husband, this, this and that, whatever. You have to hold your home. You have to grow up. That This, this one marriage is all about. This one motherhood is about. You have to protect your, your children. You have to protect your, your home. And she, she, she goes on. And me, I'm just dead silent. I'm like, that's just so wild. It's just occurring to me now that she probably called him mm. in that space. Who knows what he said to her? And that's why she now called me and tried to then manipulate me. Boy moms and the enablement of, of their trash sons and the patriarchy is just wild. Yeah, that's, that's what you have there. Someone who is who's enabling, enabling abuse. And it's not just a one-off incident. It's, it's, it's the culture, it's generational, mm -hmm. it's just, you just find it. That's why abuse is, is so able to thrive and it's just rampant everywhere like that because you have so many participants, women themselves, mm. who are legitimizing these behaviors, covering them up, reassigning accountability and responsibility to the wrong parties, causing people to internalize things that have nothing to do with them. That's very disappointing. And what she did is so violent. That you would try to normalize that to you, that that's what marriage is. Yeah. And what she did is so violent because this is someone that like, I, I really did take her as a mom. And I really did everything she told me. I really did. I, I didn't, I didn't have any, I took everything as this is, there's a good, with good intention. Even sometimes when she would lose her patience with me and she would say some harsh things to me. I just felt like, oh, you know, I really just trusted her. And I trusted her, her, her guidance. I, I, I trusted the things she said to me. But even in this instance, when she said, look, you just have to grow up. And she laid into me. I can never forget. She said, I should grow up. Me, mm. I should grow up. And I think she was shocked by my silence because I didn't say a word. And it wasn't that I, I intentionally didn't say a word, but I was just processing what this one was saying to me. That ah, mm. I just said all these things that your, your son did to me right now. Because I even, I made sure I brought out my notes and I was saying it mm. and I should grow up. So I was still processing. So I was silent. And I think that caught her off guard. Maybe she was expecting me to defend myself. Maybe she was expecting whatever, but I was just silent. 
So she paused. Then I think she shut just like, she finished what she wanted to say, then she hung up. Then she called me like about five minutes later. And she was just like, okay, baby, I apologize. So she apologizes. She said, she's sorry for telling me to grow up. That what I went through was really not okay. And that, you know, if I want to tell my parents, I should go ahead and tell them. And I guess whatever comes from there, we'll figure it out. Blah, blah, blah. That is is, is your decision. Is your decision. Anything you say is your decision. And then that's how we ended it. It's in retrospect now that I see how she manipulated me again there. Mm. Doing the whole, if you want to tell your parents and all of that. Because that's something I was tussling with. Mm-hmm. I have to admit, I had spoken to his sister, Pepeye. I had spoken to Polinus's mother. And then I'd also spoken to a very good friend of mine. One of my oldest friends. And that mm-hmm. one was just not having it. She just, mm-hmm. she, she wanted me to leave that house that day. She did not want to hear it. She just was not having it. So it's something I was tossing with. Ah. And mm. me in my head, I was just, I was just concerned. I'm just like, I remember February 2020, my, my second son had just started school. We had mm. just paid school fees for him. We had, he had just been in for him to start going to school. So that's part of what I was now calculating that I will now just upend all of us now and then we'll go and hold up in my parents' house mm. in Lekki, far away from where the boy, where the children are going to school, like I didn't want to disrupt their lives that way. So it just seemed, it seemed inconvenient to, to leave actually. Mm-hmm. And you know that's part of again, part of what traps women. At some point, it's staying in an abusive relationship is now a matter of convenience. It's like which one rocks the boat less, kind of thing. Mm. So I remember that's part of what I was, and my friend was just like, eh, just forget anything about what you mean by by school fees that you just paid. And all of that, mm-hmm. like my friend gets out of that house kind of thing. So she was very disappointed that I didn't leave. Mm. But list, thinking again about this uh, Polynesian mother's reaction that, eh, you can tell your parents and if you want. She was also, she, was, she, she set me up. So the way she had come at me in a way, I now realized that, ah, I wouldn't just be embarrassing this guy. I'll mm-hmm. also be embarrassing his parents. So I just felt, okay, you know what? maybe there's a way we can resolve this as within his own family network rather before including my own, because my own family will not be able to forgive and they can never forget. And I mm. didn't want to, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to be holding that cognitive dissonance each time we would go visit or spend time with my family and all of that. So it felt like, okay, maybe there can be a resolution with his own family. And boy, will I tell you, Toro, that's one of, the biggest mistakes that I made because I was not anticipating that upon my exit, upon my escape from this abusive man, this abusive marriage and his disgustingly abusive family, I was not anticipating their denial of this incident of in this, particular. Of this incident. So guys, if you've been following along, you remember that there was a family meeting called upon my escape to Canada, where my parents called, summoned this man and his family, literally dragged them by their pubes because they did not want to attend. And my mom read out these, this, this notes, this February 2020 notes to them in the family meeting. And his mother stood up in that family meeting and flat out denied it. She mm. said she doesn't know anything about it. She has never heard it before. It never happened. Blah, blah, blah. Went on and on deflected to some other random issue. I was, when I heard what happened in that meeting, Toru, I was, I was floored. I'm like, for goodness sake, you guys, this man is mad. Because wasn't she the one that then did some kind of mediation or arbitration to even then yes. finally, finally, by the time he came back from his trip, uh-huh. close the matter. So for her to... So sometime in April 2020, she shaf, because she, you know, she had been in, in Canada all this while. So when mm-hmm. she finally came into the country in April 2020, she summoned me and Paulinus to their house. Mm-hmm. We get there. No. Yeah. We, we get to the house. And okay. I'm expecting that. Okay. Finally. Because the atmosphere had been tense with me and Paulinus all this while. Oh. Me, I, just, I was just facing my front. He too. He was doing whatever the, the fuck he was doing. The woman summons the two of us there. And I'm expecting her to talk to him. 
Mm-hmm. But she, sp- she, she spoke to us. And I'm like, ah, there's no us in this situation. No. Mm. There's no equal accountability. The two of you, the two of you get mm-hmm. your act together kind of conversation. But that's how she spoke to us as if, oh, the two of us should get our act together. All this disputes. Eh, all this eh, petty disputes. Eh. <laughs> and I was so, I was very confused about the angle that she used to speak to us. In fact, she didn't even mention the incident. Mm. She just spoke to, she just spoke to it as if, ah, you people. Uh, you know, marriage is, oh, these are the problems. But the two of you need to figure out your problems and don't, don't be letting things get out of hand. And that was just the that nature. She spoke about it in such a general manner. She could have been talking about any goddamn thing. And she spoke to us as if the two of us are equal participants. Both culpable in this uh-huh. wild night. And me, yeah, of course, but me, I'd really started to just when I say it's the beginning of the end, I already started to just, mm. I already knew that this woman, I beg, I, this is not the kind mm. of thing I want any parts. I, I don't want any parts. I don't want any parts in what, in what, in what she's saying. I, I still continue to comport myself. I'm just like, nope. So all through 2020, me and Paulinus were facing our fronts. Our relationship was the worst it had ever been that 2020 because I just wasn't having it. Me, I also began therapy. I was just working on myself. I was thriving at work, thriving with my friends. Like I just you wasn't moved facing into a different room. Didn't you? Yeah, the- exactly. I moved into a different room. Like I wasn't facing this man. That's his business. Anything he wants to do. Like I just, I so was just, you were in the marriage, but you guys were in a unit that wasn't. So I'm trying to understand that then. So from 2020 until you, like that whole year living in this kind of spousal roommate <laughs> hybrid situation, were you, were you like, was this just going to be like indefinite? You were, it was were, you, indefinite. were you ready to, or willing to have this be your dynamic indefinitely? Yeah. It was already at that point where I was just like, look, I'll see you when I see you, man. Like we had our separate rooms. We, we, like, we, it, it's not to say that we didn't say a word to each other, but it just started to, how things are just being mechanical. Okay, mm. the children need this, the children need that. Like, we mm. weren't bonding as a couple. We just operated as a family responsible for this, you know, I mm. guess these two children, this one, that one, like, we have a nanny, we have, do you get what I'm saying? So we were just functioning, as, we're operating as a family, but he and I together, we were in the worst place we'd ever been. Right. And, and I'm saying that it, at least on your end, you weren't the one that was going to be the one to make a move for any kind of I wasn't initiating. reconciliation. Were you even interested in one? And then if this was the dynamic of the marriage, were you like, okay, well, this is it. Like, why not okay. contemplate leaving at that point if it's like, this is just okay. dry? Okay. So for me, I, I, I just, I completely disengaged in the sense that I was no longer putting in any work mm. because I could see, I started to just understand that despite this man's attempts and I can see now his mother, his family, whatever, but despite their attempts to almost try and frame me as part and parcel here, I am not the problem. Mm. This man is the problem. So I stopped trying to, I stopped running around like a chicken with its head cut, head, head cut off, trying to uh, maintain Mollify the emotions of the and house. Pacify exactly. And, mm-hmm. Trying to release the tension, trying to, you no, know, anything that wants to happen, let it happen. No, me, I was just facing my front, minding my business. I left it entirely in his hands. If you want you and I to work, work as a couple, then you will put in the work. You will do this, you will do that. But the guy didn't. He would not put in the work and I wasn't going to help him either way. Were there any blowouts, any rage incidents throughout he that still time? Continue, still? Like, he would still continue all his rubbish, like, get angry at this, get angry at that. And I'm like, okay. Like, but I, I, he could tell that I had hands off. Like, I was no longer running. Ha, ah, the man is mm-hmm. upset. Oh, I, I was never doing any of that. I, I stopped it immediately. And I was just like, if we're going to be better as a couple, then he would have to, he's the one that has to now reach back into Paulinus of, 2012, 2013, what he used to get me to come here in this first place. He's the one that will have to reach back to that person and, and fix this. But of course, the guy, have, having fully unmasked the way he did, 
he could never. And so me, I left the relationship as as rubbish as it was. So left to me, me, I'm even shocked that I got pregnant in December 2020 because. So did he also disengage in, in terms of, OK, sure, he still wasn't a pleasant individual to be around per se. But did he ever zero in on you again, make you the object of his rage? I have any kind of outbursts similar to that one before. Did you still feel like you were being like you were in an abusive situation, but did you still feel like you were being targeted to so, be abused? I think the, because again, 2020, I then cut my hair. I think you could, he started to see that this was a different person altogether. Mm. He could, he could tell my demeanor that I was no longer. So, you know, abusers, they always, they always, they're, they're very so good at reading the room. They're the... Very, yeah. They're very good at reading the room. Mm. So, I think you could see that he couldn't read the new me. Mm-hmm. He couldn't read how, what's put into press, how to get me. Of course, he would still rage about this issue, that issue. But I think that's where my nanny started to feel the heat. Mm. Because what, what he's upset at, he won't rage at me. He'll rage at her. Like, he, he, I think he could sense he just could no longer access me in the way that he could before. Mm-hmm. And me too, I was not giving an inch. I was like, I'm not going to leave an opening. So I mentioned I'd always, I'd wanted a third child all through 2020. We, we could never because some, some, he would, he would, you know, some fights would break out. He would rage, he would rage, he would rage, he would, he would do something. So I just, 2020 was just a very off year for us. Of course, there were some good times play. I wouldn't even say good, Highlights. I'll just say passable times sprinkled in here and there and I guess when you're abused you just take what you can get at that point in time but I think for him and even for me because again I'd started therapy he could just see that this is a new dispensation so 20, what he did that February 2020 was as far as he went all through that year and so by December 2020 this is when we had then gone to their village in Ekiti for Christmas me, I was very shocked because I'd even made sure I had, I had my friend follow us because I was just like, look, I just don't want any stress. I don't want any wahala. So I'd brought my friend as a buffer. But that December, this guy just did not give me a rest. <laughs> he was like the pl- Paulinus of 2012. He was, he was just on my matter. He was just being, he was trying to be so sweet, so loving. Me, I was very shocked because it felt like whiplash. I'm like, this whole year has been like, where is all this coming from? I didn't understand it. But uh, me, in my head, I was like, well, me, I want a third child. So all this one that the man is doing, that's his business. If this is what is going to allow me to have my baby in peace, then no problem. So I tried. I was like, okay, you know what? I'll be open to his, his pleasant behavior, quote unquote. And so December, thank God, I did in fact get pregnant. And do you, you know the funny thing, Toro? As soon as we got back to Lagos, everything January, it was like so. a switch happened. I, I remember even saying to myself that, is, it, is there something in the air in the village or something that, because I don't understand where that love came from. <laughs> and as soon as we got to Lagos, the thing has disappeared again. I'm like, ah, now wow. Back to cold estrangement. Ah, it was mm. shocking to me. So I think, I think we got through Mm -hmm. the bulk of it this time. I'm glad that we did that. Yeah. Yeah. So the next things in the email that you haven't really touched yet are the things that you described as financial negligence and sexual coercion, et cetera, Mm -hmm. which I expect to speak about on the next episode. Mm -hmm. But so how are you feeling though, recounting Recounting these things, recounting specific incidences, going back in time and putting yourself in those positions again. How are you feeling having to rehash it? And then how do you feel about the time that has passed since the progress that you have made and where you are at now with regard to the experiences that you went through, which there's a little bit of banter here, but these are really serious, scary, dangerous, traumatic scarring situations these are stories of survival and i i don't want that to be lost on on anyone i i have to admit that every day i still process things that happen that happen to me and i'm still trying to find a way to i'm still making sense of it and every day i get fresh just a fresh perspective 
even as we've been speaking, things have just been occurring to me. So mm. some days are good where I'm able to reflect, ruminate, and I'm able to come out with a, my God, thank you, God, for saving me. And that's the attitude that I'm able to carry. That's the emotion I'm able to carry. But there are some days where I'm just like, I cannot believe I allowed someone treat me in this manner. Because again, this is not who I am. I'm not mm-hmm. like this. There's no other person that has ever gotten away with treating me or mistreating me to such an extent like this. All of this, this person did to me because I loved them. Mm. And I loved myself too. That, and that's what's, that's what's just been so confusing to me because sometimes when I read some survivor stories, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I hated myself. Someone, oh, I hated myself, but I loved him. But I'm just like, no, I actually loved him. I loved the person I was before I met this man. I loved who I was. Like I loved the life that I was living but I think I just loved him more. And just that mistake of loving him more is what is what caused me to self-betray the way that I did. And my advice to any person, you ha- your own cup has to f- be full to the brim by yourself. You have to love yourself more. I don't, you just have to love yourself more than your partner. I'm sorry to say. You have to love yourself more because uh, honestly, I'm still reflecting. Some days I'm angry about what I went through. Sometimes, some days I'm grateful to God about what he brought me from and the knowledge that I have, the experience that I have. But I, I would be lying if I said that I don't, I don't mourn the innocence that I had mm. about what the world was like, about what people were like, about how purely, how freely I gave my love. And even in all this time that I was being abused, it took me a long time to even clock the abuse because I was just so generous with it. Mm. And so all of that is what I'm still discovering. Next episode, I look forward to to getting into the sexual abuse and the financial abuse because I think that as well is something that people need to hear. A lot of people are being abused and they don't even know it. And it takes guts to actually look yourself in the eye and say, this person that I love or loved, this person that I committed my life to is is, intentionally harming me. Is harming me. Yeah. And they are doing it on purpose. Because sometimes they like to act like, oh, they just made a mistake or they didn't know. No, no. They know. Yeah, I think that's it, guys. So, All right. We'll see you in the next episode. Bye, guys. Bye. My discernment about what I am facing has made me a target, but I must nonetheless speak up. Make no mistake, this is still a live and ongoing issue, and myself, my children, and loved ones continue to be in danger as a result of my coming forward with the truth. I want it on record that should any calamity befall any one of us, my abuser and his threatening family should be the first people held as persons of interest. Authenticity Warrior is available everywhere you listen to podcasts and is at Authenticity Warrior across all social media platforms. Please feel free to like and share this podcast. Thanks for listening.